How to prove the Earth is not flat? Here are 10 easy steps. Step number one, find a picture or video from space. With 3,600 satellites in orbit, this should be easy to find. However, only NASA released pictures and they all come from the Apollo missions many years ago. The picture that was made during the moon landing is still used everywhere today. In 2012, NASA released the Blue Marble Series pictures. They admit these pictures are composite and are not real. Have you seen this picture? So, if you want to believe that you have to trust NASA, why would NASA fake anything, right? How could they fake a picture back in those days? Photo and video editing was far less advanced. Of all the footage of Apollo 11 requested from NASA over a five-year period, one gem was discovered just before the completion of this documentary. An old reel received by mistake. It contains the raw or unedited footage of the crew of Apollo 11, Michael Collins, Edwin Aldrin Jr. and Neil Armstrong, staging part of their mission for nearly an hour in living color with exceptionally clear behind-the-scenes audio of conversations discussing the techniques used to achieve a disingenuous picture depicting the Earth at a distance in order to falsely demonstrate their far journey from it and their ability to survive passing through the Van Allen radiation belts. It cannot be misconstrued that this staging was done for some other reason prior to the mission, for the reel itself is slated and dated July 18th, 19th and 20th, 1969, the very days of the mission when they were said to be approaching and achieving lunar orbit. Furthermore, it is apparent they are in genuine zero gravity aboard the actual spacecraft necessary to convince the mass media of their authenticity, just not any further than Earth orbit, as you will see. In this never-before-seen or heard footage, not only is the radio conversation between the astronauts and Houston Control audible, there is a secondary, private conversation taking place between the crew and a third confidential party, prompting the astronauts with what to say, when to speak, and how to effectively manipulate the camera to achieve the desired misleading effect. NASA claims that the Houston transmissions were the only ones taking place with the astronauts. Listen now as Houston Control initiates a conversation with the crew, only to find them too preoccupied with the behind-the-scenes trickery to respond. Moments pass and the oversight is picked up on by the clandestine third party who quickly prompts them with talk. Immediately, Neil Armstrong speaks. Call Apollo 11. Houston Goldstone says that the TV looks so great. Over. Okay, uh, Roger. We're uh, in on Earth. Again, the illusion they are attempting to create is the Earth at a distance to demonstrate their far journey from it and their ability to survive passing through the Van Allen radiation belts. Understand, too, that only about 20 seconds of this raw footage was ever broadcast to the public, and these conversations discussing their deception were believed to be private until now. Here they discuss that these television transmissions were in fact not broadcast live as everyone believed. They were first screened and edited for playback later. All right, Janine, we just wanted a narrative such a weekend when we get the playback we can sort of correlate what we're saying. Thank you very much. Here they discuss the fact that they have turned out the lights and have blocked out sunlight from entering the spacecraft through the other windows as to not cause any reflected light to fall onto the spacecraft's wall in the foreground. Okay, very good. Well, we shut out the sun coming in some of the other windows into the spacecraft, so uh, it's looking through a, uh, the uh, number one window and there isn't any uh, reflected light. The reason this was done is so that the truth of the matter would not be revealed. It is this. 
Though the federal government would have you believe that this is a view of Earth from a distance out of the spacecraft's window as it nears the moon, it is not. What they have ingeniously done is placed the camera at the back of the spacecraft and centered the lens on a circular window in the foreground, outside of which it is completely filled with the Earth in low orbit. The circumference of the window then appears to be the diameter of the Earth at a distance, with the darkened walls of the spacecraft appearing to be the blackness of space around it. That is why they wanted the interior dark and blocked out the sun from entering through the other windows. Here you can see the extruded window, probably two inches thick at the bottom. This is because the Earth's shine is coming in at a downward angle. It also causes the Earth to appear to be an irregularly shaped circle, for you are seeing the outside of the window at the bottom and the inside of the window at the top, which together form two different sized halves of a circle. Subsequently, this take was never used. As they perfected the shot, a crescent-shaped piece of black material was inset slightly into the window to create the illusion of the Earth's terminator line dividing night and day. It is uncannily convincing. During this segment, intended to be edited and played back later for the worldwide television audience, dated July 18, 1969, Neil Armstrong condemns himself as he states that he is 130,000 miles out, or halfway to the moon, as the NASA flight log also states on this date, when he is in reality in low Earth orbit of a few hundred miles. Roger, Houston, Apollo 11. Call it in from about 130,000 miles out. Here, during another segment, also intended to air after review, Neil Armstrong falsely explains to the viewers how the shot is attained by putting the camera's lens to the window's glass, as it would have to be if they were the claimed distance away from the Earth. We only have one uh, window that uh, has a view of the Earth, and it's filled up with the TV camera. If the window was completely filled up with a TV camera, as he stated, then an astronaut's arm would not be able to get between the camera and the window, as it obviously does here in this outtake. South America becomes invisible just off beyond the Terminator or inside the shadow. You can also notice how the astronaut operating the camera reacted to the mistake by attempting to pan away from it. This is a segment that they believed wasn't even being recorded, much less suitable for broadcast, for the lens was being zoomed out and the scene was being changed to that of an interior of the astronauts at work and apparently the stop button popped back up on the recorder without notice. Here is the diffused work light that they used to see camera controls, but not throw light onto the spacecraft's wall. Here they remove part of the crescent insert. Finally, the iris is opened up and you can see the real location of the camera and the very bright and near Earth out the window. Here is the slate for the 19th of July and the same shot of trickery on the 19th of July and then the 20th and the same misleading shot on the 20th. Later that evening they were said to be walking on the moon. How can this be when they were in Earth orbit only nine hours earlier and the moon is some three days journey away? Furthermore, if they genuinely went to the moon why would they be faking any part of it? Why this trickery with the window? By faking being halfway to the moon, it becomes apparent that they did so because they could not even go halfway. It thus confirms that the stumbling block to their success was the lethal radiation of the Van Allen radiation belts. Since the same equipment was used on the subsequent missions in the 40 months that followed, none of them could have gone to the moon. They only increased their proficiency at staging them. 
When some TV viewers of the second man mission to the moon telephoned the networks complaining that reruns of I Love Lucy were being interrupted, it became clear that for the taxpayers, once was enough. We're going to be uh, reproducing on this nebulous texture here uh, the sun uh, rising, our sun, with the moon of Ipapopa, a distant moon they just discovered in 2008 off of Jupiter. It's like the 14th moon. And uh, this is our sun rising. Ipapopa. Hey, hold on, hold on, my camera. You get it? What's the uh, what's the planet name? Ipapopa. Ipapopa. New new. Moon. They found. It. Okay, so this is me with the light. Okay. Okay, zoom in there. Okay, if you want to be. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. I want to show its setting on one side. I want to show its setting. This is rough. I mean, we could really get the lighting exact, right? Oh, yeah. Part 2. Find a video from space. You would think it's easy to find a video, but only NASA seems to have videos that show the Earth from space. This footage was made from the ISS. NASA even has a live stream filming from the space station. Are they still using the moon landing round window trick? Uh oh, it seems like. Actually, they are using lots of tricks and techniques to fool you. Footage from inside the space station is recorded in zero-g planes or by using a green screen. That's why you almost never see open windows in these videos. That's also why they bump around so much and why they have to use hair perms for long hair. Sometimes they even admit that they are filming in the USA. Hello, my name is Bailey. Uh, this question is for Chris. What was high school like for you? To school, math and science were kind of my favorite subject. I didn't really like uh, English in, in reading too much, but I've since grown out of that and I enjoy reading now. And I played a lot of sports. And all of that happened in a little town called York, Maine, across the United States from where we're talking to you right now. Across the United States from where we are talking to you right now. So they were talking from the USA, not from space. Issues. Now let's look at some videos that are not made by NASA.
Wow. Part 3. Google Earth Google Earth shows a globe and that must be proof. Let's take a closer look at how Google Earth is made. When you launch Google Earth, you start in outer space and you miraculously zoom in. You are not just zooming in on just one picture. You are actually going through a succession of closer and closer shots, making the transition from a NASA shuttle shot to a satellite shot to a photograph from a plane. Google doesn't shoot its own images. There are a handful of companies that do that. Aerowest, Digital Globe, Terametrics, Geo Content, NASA, etc. Google Earth is the software that knits it all together. The CIA-funded company Keyhole INC made this software that was originally called Earth Viewer. In 2004, Google bought the software and renamed it to Google Earth. Jerry Brocken, we're surrounded here by maps, old maps, and you're clearly fascinated by them. They are monopolizing maps online. If you go online and you're using maps, you are probably using a Google map. And there's also some sort of sinister and worrying dimensions to Google because they buy Earth Viewer, which is the application, um, and that is funded by the CIA. This is the company that they buy that provides them with the ability to produce this. That's right. I mean, that's interesting that the CIA government had a hand in funding. Kiho INC was founded in 2001 by John Hank. Prior to that, he worked in foreign affairs for the US government in Washington DC and Myanmar. John also co-founded two gaming companies, Archetype Interactive and Big Network. He worked on one of the early MMDs called Meridian 59. In 2002, NVIDIA partnered with Kiho INC and released EarthViewer 3D. Here's what they said about it. EarthViewer 3D transforms the way people receive and use geospatial information by delivering a three-dimensional model planet Earth. While Google Earth is very detailed for most parts of the world, the South Pole has a lot less detail. A lot of areas are censored or blurred out. The border of the Antarctic and its pitch black it looks very weird in many places. But hey, don't worry, here's, here's what you can see. Explore Mars in 3D with Google Earth 5.0. To begin your journey, just go to the top toolbar and select Mars. This will fly you away from Earth to the red planet. Before exploring today's imagery, let's open the historical maps layer and travel back more than 100 years to see some earlier visions of Mars. Giovanni Schiaparelli drew this map in 1890. These antique maps show how our knowledge of Mars has changed and evolved over time. Let's see what the planet looks like today by opening the Mars Gallery folder and following the path of NASA's Exploration Rover, Opportunity, 
which landed in this crater in 2004 and is still making tracks today. You can follow its path on the red line and zoom in to see super high resolution imagery. Use the search tool to find places like the mysterious face on Mars. If you want to learn more, click the green Traveler's Guide to Mars icons and read an excerpt from this guidebook to Mars. You can also chat with Meliza, a friendly Martian robot. Let's travel over to Vallis Marineris, the largest known canyon in the solar system, stretching approximately 4,000 kilometers. For the newest imagery available from Mars, go to the Live from Mars layer. High-resolution NASA satellite imagery is available within hours of it being downloaded from currently orbiting spacecraft. Play the tour to orbit around the planet and see photos being taken by the Mars Odyssey team. In case you're feeling lost, join our Mars experts on a guided tour around the red planet with audio narration. Pause the tour at any time to explore on your own. And if you know your way around, use the touring feature to record your own mission to Mars. Part 4. World Maps and Antarctica. Let's take a closer look at the different world maps. Wikipedia tells us, a world map is a map of most or all of the surface of the Earth. A map is made using a map projection, which is any method of representing a globe on a plane. All projections distort distance and directions. Each projection distributes those distortions differently. The Mercator projection is used since 1569. Wikipedia tells us, the Mercator projection distorts the size of objects as the latitude increases from the equator to the poles, where the scale becomes infinite. So, for example, Greenland and Antarctica appear much larger than they actually are relative to land masses near the equator. What? One measure of a map's accuracy is a comparison of the length of corresponding line elements on the map and globe. Therefore, by construction, the Mercator projection is perfectly accurate along the equator and nowhere else. Of course, this is all based on the theory that Earth is a globe. Now, let's take a look at the azimuth equidistance projection, or the flat Earth projection on a plane. Wikipedia tells us these projections is used by the USGS in the National Atlas of the USA. While it may have been used by ancient Egyptians, the earliest text describing this projection dates from around the year 1000. Mercator used it for an inset of the North Pole regions in his map. The logo of the United Nations is a polar azimuthal projection. Azimuthal equidistant projections are also used in radars. In case of radio, this projection allows for antenna aiming. All points on the map are at correct distance from the center point. At any point, the North Pole and South Pole is at the exact opposite side since the South Pole is all around. Again, this is all based on the theory that Earth is a globe. If it would be flat, that doesn't mean there is an edge or end if the North Pole is the center and Antarctica is all around. There could be much more than the map shows us. Operation Deep Freeze is the code name for a series of missions to Antarctica by the United States beginning in 1955. Admiral Richard E. Byrd led an expedition to explore further inland and conducted the first flight over the South Pole. Let's hear what he has to say. I must say that Admiral Byrd, our guest tonight, is not only our greatest living explorer, but he's been an inspiration to countless Americans. Admiral Byrd, you've been to both the North Pole and the South Pole. Is there any unexplored land left on this Earth that might appeal to adventurous young Americans? Uh, yes, there is. And not up around the North Pole, because it's getting crowded up there now, because they find out it's really usable, not only to live in, but militarily. But strangely enough, there's left in the world today an area as big as the United States that's never been seen by a human being. And that's beyond the pole on the other side of the South Pole from Middle America. 
and it's uh, I think it's quite astonishing that there should be an area as big as that unexplored. Well, it's a tremendous So challenge. there's a lot of adventure left mm. down at the bottom of the world. Well, Admiral, do you hope to see that? I do. The South Pole, the center of a plateau, 10,000 feet high. The North Polar Sea is surrounded by um, continents that are slightly frozen. The Antarctic continent is surrounded by uh, a belt of ice, frozen seas of at least 1,200 miles thick. Now, the South is a plateau. It gets, in some places, 14,000 feet up. Uh, I've been over areas about 13,000. And it's a little bit chilly up there. So there's a, there's that big difference between the top and bottom of the world. I don't con the North really isn't very cold up there on the Arctic Ocean. Not compared to the South. I don't know, we often hear it said that our young American. In 1961, the Antarctic Treaty system was created. The treaty sets aside Antarctica as a scientific preserve and bans military and most other activity on the continent. For the purpose of the treaty system, Antarctica is defined as all of the land and ice shelves south of the 60 degree latitude. You need to listen carefully to what is said at the end. They know that Prince Harry and a team of injured servicemen and women have been walking to the South Pole. Well, they've got there. They've completed the 200-mile Walking with the Wounded South Pole Challenge. That's its proper name. Uh, they've spent more than three weeks trekking through Antarctica. And this was what it sounded like at the moment when they arrived at the bottom of the world. Sounds quite restrained, doesn't it, after all that effort? Well, they spent 20 hours in a cold chamber. This was the prince and the other competitors who were with him uh, to prepare for the conditions that they were going to find down there. The expedition was supposed to be a race. You might remember it being billed that way before it started, but the weather became so bad as they went along that they scrapped the competitive side of things and just joined up as one big team instead. And this was how Harry reacted after completing the mission. Um, we're here, we made it. It's Friday the 13th. Um, We've had so many things go against us. We've had beautiful weather, but bad weather before, and bad terrain, and injuries, and stuff like that, but um, everyone's made it, all 12 of them, the whole group of 20, whatever it is, but the 12 wounded soldiers have made it. Um, couldn't have made it without everyone's help, especially back home, you know, the founders, uh, Ed and, 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 and Simon as well. But, um, everyone is everyone is so happy. Everyone's touched the ball, we've all had photos, we've all had hugs, a few tears here and there, but um, all in all, um, mission success, basically. <laughs> If you're wondering about that ball that he was talking about, it's the, the ceremonial South Pole at the Amundsen Scott South Pole Station. It's, a, it's like a metal sphere on a red and white pole, and it's partly surrounded by the flags of the signatories of the Antarctic Treaty. So it's lovely for a photo, but the problem with it is it's not, it's not the real South Pole. It's about... 300 meters away so at the <laughs> so real you, south pole what is, is it well there's nothing that's the thing it's you, you can't see so to do it properly to cover all your bases you have to do both you have to do the picture with the ball and then you have to go and kind of hang around at the exact um why don't they move longitude the ball to and where latitude. the actual thing is well that's a very sensible well, question it's not what i can answer <laughs> okay. but it's a very good point let's have a look at the weather Part 5. Plane Routes Nobody has a monopoly on what is a very hard problem. But we don't have time for a meeting of the Flat Earth Society. In this video, we compare plane routes on the globe and flat Earth. Let's try to book a flight from Australia to Argentina. The distance between the two places is around 12,500 kilometers. The average cruising speed of a Boeing is around 800 kilometers per hour. That means a non-stop flight should take around 16 hours. It is impossible to find non-stop flights. All the flights go through San Francisco, Houston and Los Angeles. The fastest route we can find takes us almost 35 hours. 
This doesn't make much sense, does it? Let's see how it looks on the flat earth map. It makes way more sense. Everything makes more sense on the flat earth map. Let's try from Australia to South Africa. The distance is around 10,000 kilometers. The flight time from Australia to South Africa is 13 hours and 14 minutes. After a long search, we found one non-stop flight. Flight time, 14 hours, 20 minutes. When we try to book the flight, the flight time changes to 19 hours and 30 minutes with one stop. The fastest we can get there seems to be around 20 hours with one stop in Singapore. Travel time, 20 hours and 55 minutes. Online flight trackers never show planes above the oceans in the southern hemisphere. Why? Uh, this flight path starts in the middle of nowhere. That's because what they do with flights in the southern hemisphere is they disappear and they turn off the GPS over the ocean and then they reappear the flights about an hour before landing. And that's exactly what the Flat Earth guy said they do. And that's exactly what they're doing. <laughs> that's exactly what they're doing. So I just clicked on this flight, same thing. This guy, we should have saw him before when we were tracking the other plane. And when we were tracking this plane that's heading to Rome. But this guy, when we were tracking the plane headed to Rome, he wasn't even on the map. He's coming from Abu Dhabi. It's in the Middle East. He's been in the air for what, 12, 13, 14, 15 hours? He's been in the air for 7,000 miles and we're just picking him up right here. <laughs> we're just picking him up in the middle of nowhere. Look. First, satellite tracks of young sea turtles in the South Atlantic Ocean. They even have solar panels. But we can't track planes? Flight trackers combine data from several data sources. The primary technology that flight trackers use is called ADS-B. Biosat coverage uses it. Panasonic avionics coverage. Satellite ADS-B. SATCOM coverage. That's back from 2013. Dr. D's friend, Mr. Gano, works at NASA Langley Research Center. He develops new instruments for global positioning systems and has agreed to meet with us. If anyone can help us learn more about GPS, he can. GPS, or Global Positioning System, is a constellation system of 29 Earth-orbiting satellites that were originally designed by the U.S. military in the 1970s as a navigation system. 29 sounds like a lot of satellites. Why do you need so many? It takes 24 satellites to provide global coverage, leaving five spares. The orbits are arranged so that at any given time, anywhere on Earth, there are at least four satellites visible. Why do four satellites need to be visible? Your GPS receiver needs four satellites in order to determine its own location. How does our GPS locate itself? By using a simple mathematical principle called trilateration. I'm not sure simple and trilateration should be used in the same sentence. What is trilateration? It's kind of tricky to explain in three-dimensional space. So let's start with a two-dimensional example. Let's say you're totally lost somewhere in the U.S and your GPS is not working. Like us, yesterday when we couldn't find our geocache. As you are trying to find where you are, a friendly person tells you that you are a thousand kilometers from Boise, Idaho. Do you know where you are? No, I could be 1,000 kilometers in any direction from Boise. Exactly. Now let's say another friendly person comes by and tells you that you're 1,110 kilometers from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Do you know where you are? Not yet, but I'm getting closer to my location. That's right. Now you have two choices. 
but you still don't know where you are. Finally, another friendly person informs you that you are 990 kilometers from Tucson, Arizona. Now, do you know where you are? It looks like I'm in Denver, Colorado, which of course I will be soon. The same concept works in three-dimensional space, but instead of circles, you need to think in terms of spheres. And the satellites are the friendly people telling you how far you are from a place. That's right. If you know your distance from satellite A, you could be anywhere on a huge imaginary sphere at that radius. If you know your distance from satellite B, you can overlap the first sphere with the second sphere and they intersect in a perfect circle. So if you know the distance to a third satellite, you get a third sphere which intersects with the circle at two points. Very good. And the Earth acts as the fourth sphere, so you can eliminate the point in space because you're on Earth. So do you only need three satellites? An approximate position can be found with three satellites, but to improve accuracy and get precise altitude information, four or more are better. How do GPS receivers know how far they are from the satellite? They analyze the high-frequency, low-powered radio signals from the GPS satellites and calculate the time the signal traveled. Do satellites have stopwatches? No. The satellites need to be more accurate than a stopwatch. The satellites use a very accurate atomic clock which produces exact time-coded signals. And what happens if a satellite malfunctions? It's possible. Again, that's why we have 29 satellites when only 24 are needed, leaving a few spares. It helps to have extra. True. Here at NASA we use GPS to determine the position of aircraft and satellites. And we also are developing a system to perform remote sensing of the environment. All of these tasks require precision information. Spare satellites make sure we get the data we need. Cool. NASA's always doing amazing things. Mr. Gannell, what would happen if your GPS was only receiving a signal from one or two satellites? Would you get incorrect results? No. Usually, your GPS device will let you know that it doesn't have enough satellites to calculate an accurate position. Sounds like we need to do some more research. Thanks, Mr. Gannell. You're welcome, and good luck with your geocaching. They've been talking down new sources of energy. They dismiss wind power. They dismiss solar power. They make jokes about biofuels. They were against raising fuel standards. I guess they like gas guzzlers. They think that's good for our future. We're trying to move towards the future. They, they want to be stuck in the past. And we've heard this kind of thinking before. Let me tell you something. If some of these folks were around when Columbus set sail, they, 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 they must have been founding members of, of the Flat Earth Society. They, they would not have believed that the world was round. Part 6, Curvature. Earth's curvature is approximately 8 inches per mile, or 20 centimeter per kilometer. But how far can your eyes see? You can see these stars, they are far away. You see them as tiny dots while they are massive. Take a look at this picture. The train track gets smaller and smaller until you can't see it anymore. Luckily, we have cameras these days that can see much better. The argument, for all practical purposes, came to an end when the Church of England was established by law during the 16th century. They rejected many laws of the ancient Catholic Church and, to appear forward-thinking, they embraced many radical scientific notions prevalent at the time, including Copernicus' round earth theory. With this endorsement, the theory found its way into the schools, which were then largely controlled by the Church. It has remained there to this day, and many children have accepted it without question. Perhaps the most significant experiments were those carried out on a canal known as the Old Bedford Level. 
Located in Cambridgeshire, England, the canal is perfectly straight over an uninterrupted six-mile stretch. While there, Parallax conducted many experiments, all towards one conclusion, to prove that the surface of the water in the canal was indeed perfectly flat. In one experiment, a boat carrying a flag rode from one bridge to another six miles away. An observer with a telescope placed eight inches above the surface of the water found that the flag and the boat were distinctly visible throughout the entire distance. If the Earth is a sphere with a circumference of 25,000 miles, then over a distance of six miles, the second bridge should mathematically be 16 feet below the observer's eye line. This flat earth experiment, measuring the expected curvature of the earth across water from Torre del Mar beach to Torrox Costa Lighthouse in Spain, distance of 771 miles, expected curvature drop of 39.6 feet, camera height approximately 2 feet above sea level.
Part 7 Copernicus With a sphere of 4,000 miles radius being a, a spun around once every 24 hours, a little bit of calculations will show that that person there is being spun around at about 1,000 miles an hour and it doesn't know it. I mean, this is obvious nonsense. You go on a merry-go-round and it goes, I doubt, more than 10 miles an hour and you get off all dizzy. You mean to tell me that people can be spun round at approximately 1,000 miles an hour and not know it? Why, if this is so, this whole room that we're in it is supposedly being spun round as something of approximately that order of speed and we don't know it. Beneath the marble floor of Frombork Cathedral in northeast Poland is the dusty crypt where local legend says astronomer Nicholas Copernicus is buried. Copernicus, the man who put the sun at the center of the universe. Copernicus, born in 1473, was schooled at a time when classical ideas were again ascendant. Copernicus studied law and medicine. But after his uncle became the bishop of the northernmost diocese in Poland, he arranged for Copernicus to become a canon of Frombork Cathedral, ensuring a lifelong position. Copernicus was in fact sent to Italy to graduate school uh, to study both regular law and canon or church law. But while he was at it, he got some tutorials in astronomy. But all the time, he was keeping up, buying astronomy books. And that was very important because Copernicus did live in the early days of printing. And it made it possible for him to get a lot of material that way. Copernicus was troubled by the Ptolemaic, Earth-centered system that was almost universally accepted during his lifetime. It required complex heavenly mechanics called epicycles to explain the seemingly odd motions of the planets. But when Copernicus tinkered with Ptolemy's model, placing the sun at the center of things, he found a much more aesthetically satisfying result. The Earth. He was motivated not so much by scientific observation, but by his concept of beauty and simplicity. He wrongly believed the planets circled the sun in perfect circular orbits. The whole thing was completely ridiculous. If the Earth is spinning around every 24 hours and you throw a stone up into the air, it's going to land in another county. And think of the poor birds. So Copernicus was going against all common sense. Perhaps because of this, and because his sun-centered or heliocentric system might be considered heretical, Copernicus kept his theories largely to himself. Not until late in life was he finally persuaded to explain his ideas more fully in a book called Concerning the Revolutions of the Celestial Orbs. He died in 1543, before it was published, and was buried without fanfare near the altar of his beloved cathedral, unaware of the impact his ideas would soon have. A little bit of calculations will show that that person there is being spun round at about a thousand miles an hour and it doesn't know it. We view the universe has a profound impact on our understanding of ourselves. Today we see the earth as a small fragile globe orbiting at just the right distance from the sun for life to flourish. It appears to be the only planet with life in the solar system and the planets themselves are mere specks in the vacuum of space. Human life seems reduced to insignificance when set against the vast, nearly empty spaces of modern astronomy. But before the modern era, the universe appeared much more comfortable and accommodating. Thus medieval European cosmology placed the Earth in the center of a small spherical universe surrounded by the abode of God and the elect. 
The passage of day and night is described in the Bhagavatam as a straight terminator rotating over a plane map, as we see here. Although this does not make sense in a literal plane, it is realistic in the planisphere model, and thus it adds weight to this model. Here we see the ecliptic and the zodiac projected stereographically onto the Earth map. The Sun and Zodiac revolve clockwise together once per day, while the Sun moves counterclockwise around the Zodiac once per year. Here the Zodiac is projected stereographically onto Bhumandala. Note that as the Sun goes around the off-centered Zodiac in its yearly orbit, it crosses the ring-shaped islands and oceans of Bhumandala. This ocean crossing motion is described in the Puranas, and this also adds weight to the planisphere model. Bhumandala can be compared with an astronomical instrument called an astrolabe, which was popular in the Middle Ages. On the astrolabe, the off-centered circle represents the orbit of the Sun, the ecliptic. In an astrolabe, the Earth is represented in stereographic projection on a flat plate called the Mater. The ecliptic circle and important stars are represented on another plate called the Ret. Different planetary orbits could likewise be represented by different plates, and these would be seen projected onto the Earth plate when one looks down on the instrument. The Bhagavatam similarly presents the orbits of the Sun, the Moon, and important stars on a series of planes parallel to Bhumandala. The orbits of the planets are placed on additional parallel planes. Here we see the Bhagavatam's model of the orbits of the Sun, Moon, and 28 important star constellations. These lie in three planes parallel to Bhumandala. The layout is comparable to that of an astrolabe. Seen from the side, we find that the moon is higher than the sun, but this is simply an artifact of the astrolabe model. It should not be taken as physical. Seen from above, everything falls into place in projection in an astronomically realistic way. With a sphere. Part 8. Boats Below the Horizon When a ship sails away, it gradually sinks below the horizon. Is this because of the curvature? Let's try to take a closer look.
Is it only a matter of perspective? You decide, find your own tool. Part 9 The Sun According to the Flat Earth model, the Sun and Moon are the same size. The Sun is not millions of light years away, the Sun is not millions of miles big. The model claims that the Sun and Moon are circling around 3,000 miles above the flat Earth. The Sun's area of light is limited to a finite circular area around it. The view of rising and setting are caused by perspective. Let's look at some videos and pictures. The direction of the Sun rays proves the Sun is close to Earth. Hot spot usually indicates the light source is close. If the sun is millions of miles away, it should look like this. This is a Photoshop image. Solar Probe Plus, a new NASA mission to visit and study the sun closer than ever before, is officially underway. The spacecraft will plunge directly into the sun's atmosphere at approximately 4 million miles from the surface, into a region no other spacecraft has ever encountered. Sunrise and sunset time lapse, Bristol City Center. If the sunrise is caused by perspective, the sun should get bigger as it gets closer, depending on where you are on Earth. When the sun moves away, it should shrink.
first official sunset in four months. So how can we explain seasons? If the flat earth model is correct, it's impossible to have six months sunlight in Antarctica. So how can we explain this time lapse? Did we finally debunk the flat earth model? Conclusion in part 10 Part 10. The Sun in Antarctica. In the previous video, we discussed this time lapse. It shows 24 hour daylight in Antarctica. A lot of people have been saying that this is impossible. So let's keep researching this. This video is made by NWO.NL. New World Order? NWO receives 400 million euros a year from the government. NWO promotes scientific research at Dutch universities. Can we trust this? It's almost winter solstice for the southern hemisphere. Four more days, June 21st. That means Antarctica has no sunlight at the moment. So I had to look at different webcams all over Antarctica. All the screenshots are taken at the same moment, unless stated otherwise. Location, New Mare Station. Location, Halley Station.
Location Palmer Station Location Scott Base Location McCardo Station Location KC Station Location KC Station three hours later Location Dave Station Location Master Station Location Mountain Station three hours later. Location Mountain Station four hours later. Looks like we failed again to debunk the flat earth. Did we debunk the globe model even more? Do your own research. Thanks for watching.